it's a gun with an effective range of 2,000 yards. In modern military operations, this kind of pinpoint accuracy is expected. But the roadmap to this advanced weapon dates all the way back to the Revolutionary War, when George Washington saw the battlefield potential of a gun that had been used by hunters for almost three centuries. These rifles were incredibly effective at 100 to 200 yards. And Washington knew this in the American Revolution. As American militias clashed with British soldiers, Washington recruited woodsmen with their accurate hunting rifles. He used them as prototype snipers. It was almost like a terror weapon. It was good at hitting individuals. That's the beginning of a sniper's culture, where you start to pick out a target of high value. And he stalks that individual and shoots him. The rifle is so accurate because of one unique feature that is best illustrated by a quarterback spiral pass. The quarterback rolls the football between his fingers and thumb as he releases it, causing the ball to spin in midair. One of the basic principles of physics is that a spinning object resists any change in direction, so the ball travels farther and with greater accuracy. The same principle works for footballs and ballistics. If we compare the barrel of a rifle with that of a musket, we see that the musket is smooth on the inside. It has a smooth bore. A rifle's bore, on the other hand, is scored with spiral grooves. These grooves cause the bullet to spin as it shoots down the barrel. Just like it does with the football, the spin has a gyroscopic effect, stabilizing the bullet during flight. But the stable, accurate bullet comes at a price. The rifle is very slow to load. It's a tight squeeze inside the grooved barrel, so the ball has to be jammed into place. The solution didn't come until the 1840s. But when it arrived, it was not the gun design that changed. It was the ammunition. The Minier bullet, named after its French inventor, Claude Etienne Minier, is ingenious in its simplicity. Four greased grooves let it slide easily down the barrel. But the real innovation is the hollow base. On ignition, the base expands, gripping the spiral grooves of the barrel and making the bullet spin. With the arrival of the Minier bullet, the rifle evolved into the rifled musket. It was ready for the battlefield. Eighteen sixty two, the Civil War Battle of Antietam. 87,000 Union troops confronted 40,000 Confederates. For one of the first times in history, both armies were equipped with a new generation of rifled muskets. The results were devastating. Here we have two weapons that were used during the American Civil War. This is a smoothbore musket firing a round ball. This is a rifled musket firing a conical Minier bullet. In a test of accuracy from 75 yards, it's easy to see the difference. First, the smoothbore musket. Next up, the rifled musket with Minier bullet. Okay, 
smoothbore, 69 caliber. May have broken both arms, but there's only two hits out of uh, six shots. Uh, we're out past the effective range of this of the guy hitting who he's aiming at. And that creates problems when you're trying to kill people. The rifled musket did better. First three shots, this guy would lose his arm up here, probably his collarbone. This is probably close to a gut shot up on the hip. You've reduced the fighters by six men. Here you've reduced them by two men. At 75 yards, all six shots from the rifled musket hit the target, making it three times more effective than the smoothbore. So you can load this weapon almost as quickly as a smoothbore musket, but it fires very accurately. And that makes weapons incredibly deadly. Not only were the new weapons more lethal, they arrived at a time when they could be mass produced. In the decades leading up to the Civil War, a revolution was taking place at armories like Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Industrialization was driving weapons production to new levels of efficiency. Individual craftsmen were replaced by automation. Lathes carved rifle stocks, and machine tools copied gun barrels. The outcome was standardization. Identical firearms with interchangeable parts. And as the country surged toward civil war, one more innovation. Repeater rifles eliminated the need for front loading by placing the powder and bullets into metal cartridges that could be loaded using a magazine. One shot could now be fired every three seconds. The repeater rifle, too, would leave its mark. At the Battle of Antietam, one tiny cornfield changed hands 15 times in 12 hours. The fighting killed more than 3,500 men. And by the end of the day, there were almost 23,000 casualties. The single bloodiest day in American military history. The new rifled muskets played a potent role in the carnage. The Minier bullets they fired also proved devastating, both during the battle and afterwards. Many gunshot victims died later from agonizing infections. Today's modern ballistics tests can help reveal why. Firearms expert George Wunderlich believes there is a difference between the impact of a solid musket ball and that of a hollow Minier bullet. He uses ballistic gelatin blocks to simulate human tissue for the test. We're going to see if this will help tell us what were the doctors actually seeing in the wounds they were treating during the course of the war. First up is the ball from the smoothbore musket. Next is the rifle and the minier. Let's take a look at our test results. As we can see, the round ball has lodged in our ballistic gel. When we go over here, this is our newer technology. This is the mini bullet, the conical bullet that came out of our rifle. And what we see here is that the velocity has allowed the bullet to be carried completely out of the block. No bullet has been trapped. Although it is still lodged in the body, the solid musket ball has created a straight wound that would most likely heal quite quickly. But the spinning Minier bullet has left a trail of destruction in its wake, damaging tissue and leaving a more complex, serious wound. During the Civil War, surgeons would often amputate wounded limbs to avoid fatal secondary infections. The battlefield had gotten more deadly. And to make matters worse, commanders were slow to adapt to the new military landscape. While the technology has changed, the tactics really haven't changed. Marching right out in the open, shoulder to shoulder, like they would have done in the days of Napoleon. Even in Napoleon's time, this was dicey. In the age of rifled muskets, this was suicide. Fire! 
when a new technology appears and you're confronted with it, you rely on the old ways. And what it ends up becoming is a slaughter. It took time and many lost lives before the Civil War commanders adjusted their tactics to the capabilities of the new weapons. But when they finally reacted, their countermeasures augured those that would come later in World War I. They built trenches. As soldiers returned to their fields and towns after the Civil War ended, the industrial processes that had revolutionized the production of their weapons began shifting from military to civilian products. Everything from sewing machines to locomotives. Not just firearms, but all kinds of different products begin to copy that idea of making interchangeable parts. We're not quite at Ford's assembly line, but we're on the way there. There's always some, we can call it a rake-off, some benefit to society. It's perhaps ironic, though, that we always seem to feel we need to start by killing people. That's the first major aim that drives us. And then we are willing to apply this to more peaceful circumstances. Just like the weapons that came before them, today's modern firearms use the latest technology to maximize range, accuracy, strength, and rate of fire. In the modern arsenal, the machine gun, like this 50 caliber roof-mounted M2, reigns supreme. The M2 can shoot 500 rounds per minute, but its origins, too, date back to the Civil War. As with the rifled musket, industrialization laid the technological foundation for the development of the machine gun. Above all else, it was focused on rapid rate of fire. Ironically, an American doctor, Richard J. Gatling, was the first to come up with a successful design. At a time when rifles were firing three shots per minute and repeater rifles got up to about 20, the Gatling gun could unleash 600. The gun saw some limited use in the Civil War and was a monumental proof of concept, but its hand crank and bulkiness made it awkward to use on the battlefield. It would take an additional two decades and another inventor to truly realize the machine gun's potential. The inventor was Hiram Maxim. Born in Maine, he was the son of a mechanic. His early inventions were innocuous, a curling iron, various coffee substitutes, nothing to presage his eventual claim to fame. But in 1881, Maxim emigrated to Europe. He later claimed he was told by an acquaintance that if he wanted to be rich, he should invent something to enable these Europeans to cut each other's throats with greater facility. Maxim obliged and created one of World War I's most infamous weapons, the Maxim machine gun. The technological breakthrough of the Maxim is that it doesn't rely on a crank handle to fire. As it fires, the gun's recoil forces back the firing block. In one motion, this draws a new bullet from the belt and the spent cartridge from the firing chamber, pushes the new bullet into the firing chamber, and ejects the spent cartridge. And it does it 600 times a minute. Such high-speed firing heats up the barrel, so a water-filled jacket keeps it from overheating. Though many soldiers mistrusted machine guns because of their tendency to jam, the Maxim's reliability quieted the skeptics. With the Great War looming, countries on both sides lined up to purchase it and its follow-up designs. Its raw killing power would soon be unleashed. July 1st, 1916, the Battle of the Somme on Europe's Western Front. At 7.30 a.m., the first Allied soldiers went over the top. 
the infantrymen were ordered to cross no man's land and assault the German trenches. They thought the German defenses had been destroyed by artillery. But that wasn't the case. What ensued was a massacre. The battalions that attacked at the Somme basically stood up and walked into German fire with full packs on their backs. The German machine gunners are so horrified at this that they're waving at British soldiers to go back. And then when they realize they're not going back, they gun them down. One Allied regiment lost an unimaginable 92% of its men. The Maxim sprayed a wall of fire that cut down everything in its path. With such volume, accuracy was irrelevant. You see where the rounds are hitting or impacting out there, you don't even have to aim. If you have a, a line of troops coming towards you, you merely keep shooting where you see those fellows falling, and you keep shooting into them. The gunners learned to increase their kill rate by employing a tactic called interlocking fire. They would sweep the machine guns from side to side across the battlefield, where adjacent zones of fire crossed, enemy soldiers would face double the number of bullets. The machine gun, trenches, artillery, and barbed wire defined the course of World War I. It was a defensive stalemate with unbearable losses, where individual deaths devolved into statistics. Today's machine guns owe much to the original Maxim, but more than the gun itself, it was the concept of rapid fire that drove innovation. Soon after the Maxim came the submachine guns, which fired pistol rounds in rapid succession. The most famous was the Tommy gun, first used by gangsters, then by soldiers. But in the end, it would be a more adaptable weapon that best fit the needs of the universal soldier. That weapon is the assault rifle. Today, it is the standard firearm of virtually every soldier in the world. It's popular because it's versatile, capable of single shots and bursts of fire. The U.S. Army's current weapon, the M4, is highly advanced. It evolved from the American M16. But in the world of assault rifles, it was a lower tech weapon, the AK-47, that proved most accessible. The AK-47, or automatic Kalashnikov of the year 1947, uh, has really been, in many ways, one of the most important firearms in history. The AK's Soviet designer, Mikhail Kalashnikov, was a tank commander in World War II. His assault rifle was adopted by the Red Army in 1949. Kalashnikov received the Stalin Prize first class for his invention. The AK-47 is the most widely used military weapon in the world. Up to 100 million are thought to have been sold. It is the first choice of armies, militias, freedom fighters, and terrorists. Strip an AK down, and it's easy to see why. First of all, it's a very simple mechanism. We have a dust cover, a mainspring, a bolt carrier, and inside the bolt carrier, a bolt. We don't have a lot of moving parts, but what we do have is a certain looseness. You can hear that rattle. That rattle means that the parts have been given a certain amount of play. That play allows this weapon to function, even though there may be dirt or filth from the firing of the weapon encrusted inside these grooves. That play means a high degree of reliability. The weapon's simplicity also means anyone can learn to use it. The 
is the guerrilla weapon of choice everywhere because it is the great equalizer with people whose societies are not as technologically inclined and you see them everywhere. America got its first real taste of the AK-47 in Korea and then Vietnam, where US troops found themselves fighting against Soviet supplied combatants. While the AK wasn't the deciding factor in the Vietnam War, it played a part and came to symbolize an important difference between the American and Soviet approaches to technology. The U.S. soldiers were equipped with an early version of the high-tech M16 rifle, the standard issue American rifle by 1967. It had great accuracy and range. The North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, on the other hand, had the lower tech AK-47. What we basically have is a pickup truck and a Lamborghini. The AK-47 was meant to be very durable, very rugged, very simple and inexpensive to manufacture. The M16 was supposed to be lightweight, also very accurate. It was, but in the early years of the war, it also had a tendency to jam in the damp and dirty jungle. The more simple Soviet gun was better suited to the harsh conditions. We see stories from Vietnam that say that they were dug out of ditches or found in rivers, uh, even buried, and then shot with no problem. It seems that dirt simply didn't affect this weapon. Well, now let's see if this will actually fire. It was incredibly reliable, incredibly insensitive to abuse, and on a number of occasions, Marine units would re-equip themselves with captured AK-47 simply to take advantage of the reliability. Over time, the reliability issues of the M16 were worked out. And it and the AK-47 made the assault rifle a universal weapon of war, a deadly culmination of the age-old quest to balance and extend range, accuracy, and rate of fire. With such lethal weapons on the battlefield, defensive technology was lagging behind. But body armor, which had fallen by the wayside when gunpowder arrived, was poised for a return. The modern incarnation came from an unlikely source. In 1965, while working on a new material for car tires, DuPont chemist Stephanie Qualick discovered a synthetic fiber that was light and flexible, but five times stronger than steel. DuPont called the material Kevlar. A decade later, its military potential became clear. Body armor was back. Well, here's the entry hole. Let's see what damage it's done. It hasn't gone through. I can feel it down at the bottom here. Kevlar's strength is in its fibers, which act like a spider web catching a fly. The fibers absorb and disperse the energy of a bullet, preventing it from penetrating. The Kevlar jacket is effective against Scott's pistol but it can only do so much against the high-velocity rounds of today's battlefields. For better protection, troops combine Kevlar with ceramic plates made from boron carbide, one of the hardest synthetic materials in the world. From a distance, the AK bullet appears to have gone right through the plate. You can see it's fragmented. There's lots of small pieces here. If we turn the plate over, you can see nothing has come through this side. The body armor with Kevlar and ceramics has impressive stopping power. Thick steel would be just as effective, 
But to get the same level of protection, a soldier would need a plate half an inch thick. The steel weighs 40 pounds. The Kevlar and ceramic plate, just over 24. Light, strong body armor is now standard issue and a critical component of a modern soldier's fighting gear. With assault rifles to attack the enemy and advanced body armor to protect them from attack, today's warriors are well adorned. But the equipment does not end there. Other less high-profile technologies also play a critical role. 1991, Operation Desert Storm. Coalition forces invade Iraq. And for the first time in history, an army is fully equipped with night vision devices. From tanks down to individual soldiers, the coalition can now fully exploit the night. They can see while their enemies are blind. The technology is a game changer. Night vision works by absorbing and amplifying ambient light. Even starlight provides enough illumination for the powerful goggles. When a soldier looks through the specially designed lens, the amplified light allows him to penetrate the darkness and see his enemy. It effectively turns night into day. The goggles can even be used while looking through a rifle sight. Military issue goggles use similar but superior technology to that in police night scopes. Lights! Night vision cameras are needed to follow the action. The green image on the right is what the soldier sees through the goggles. Without them, the enemy sees this. Night vision equipment has fundamentally changed the nature of war. It has changed the United States Armed Forces from a force that prefers to fight by day to one that prefers to fight by night. What will the next big breakthrough be? On the horizon are emerging technologies that may provide the modern warrior with almost superhuman powers. Among the most promising is an exoskeleton that is currently being developed for the U.S. Army. Historically, infantry could carry a maximum of half their body weight, but the robotic exoskeleton allows a soldier to carry 200 pounds without tiring. On the battlefield, it may eventually provide soldiers with greater strength, endurance, and agility. But for many, the ultimate goal is not to protect or enhance the soldier, but to keep him entirely out of harm's way. Now you have devices being developed that could go into a building, into an enclosed area, be armed, and be able to take on an enemy combatant without exposing the operator. Like gunpowder, assault rifles, and night vision, Armed, remote-control robots could completely transform ground warfare. And their arrival is less science fiction than fact. The Pentagon has stated that by 2015, it expects robots to replace 30% of its armed vehicles and weaponry. In a future where you will have our robots fighting their robots, I think that's entirely possible. I think you're going to begin to see that in ground war. I think it's inevitable as that technology improves. Perhaps inevitable, but definitely controversial. The idea of an autonomous robot, an autonomous armed robot, being able to move about the battlefield and make its own decisions, that's something a lot of people are leaning away from. They don't want to see it come. There has to be a human in the circuit. There has to be a man who says, this is when you pull the trigger and this is when you don't. 
It's a critical decision, and one that is often complicated by the presence of civilians on the battlefield. Here in California, at the National Training Center at Fort Irwin, Marines are learning they have to be prepared for anything. In today's conflicts, an attack can come from any quarter at any time. Enemies in civilian clothing, hidden roadside bombs, or snipers waiting to fire at exposed victims. This is the reality of warfare driven by 3,000 years of technological advance. 3,000 years where army after army look to gain their own edge while defending against the latest threats from their enemy. Where new capabilities spurred new tactics and new weapons made warfare ever more deadly. It is a scenario that will continue long into the future until humanity finds less violent ways to settle our differences.